Hi everybody, welcome back. My name is Bob and this is my creative outlet for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Um, without a doubt, the Dungeon of the Dead 3 is the deadliest location in the entire module. Um, and I don't mean that as hyperbole, I mean that I think more PCs on average will die here than anywhere else in the campaign book. And that includes Invernus. So is that a good thing? Should it be changed? How did my group fare? I intend to answer all of those questions today, but this is going to be a long video. I will try to go as fast as I possibly can and keep the summaries very succinct. I do want these videos to be at a digestible length so that they're really helpful for prep and planning. On a side note, um, I think I'm beginning to figure out how to structure these videos. Um, at first, I was just going through and summarizing and describing what my group did, but I think that these videos should be broken up into three sections. First, I plan on giving a bit of background knowledge and explaining how and when the characters should approach this encounter in the book. Second, I'll be going through page by page, uh, explaining and summarizing the information as directly as possible, uh, adding in advice or stories about my group when appropriate. Finally, I will look at the encounter as a whole and review the major takeaways. If you're new to this channel, Channel, welcome. If you like D&D Live Plays, DM Prep, uh, as well as these guides, then subscribe to the channel. You can check out all my live playlists uh, on my channel's homepage on YouTube. Okay, so let's dive in. So the background to this dungeon is fairly straightforward. It's the third location in the book. Um, once the characters meet Tarina in the Elf Song Tavern, they get a tip that the cultists that they are looking into um, are coming and going from the bathhouse just a few blocks away from the tavern. Now the book says that you should be second level at this point, but if you're using XP the traditional way, then it's very possible that your group still does not have enough experience points to enter the dungeon at level 2. Deadeye and his crew, if that was the only combat you really had in the game so far, then they would only be really worth 625 experience points. If you're going the standard route of the book, which is milestone leveling, then your character should just level up after the Elf Song Tavern. And I definitely recommend that because this is probably one of the most challenging encounters in the book, um, more so because it's long, um, it, it can be grinding on the characters. There are also some really high level challenge rating uh, encounters in the dungeon. And if you're not allowing for rests frequently, this can be an opportunity for a complete total party kill. It is a truly challenging location, but the fact that you might even be able to get here within the first session with your group is absolutely terrifying. This is a major topic of discussion that was posted on forums and social media groups. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to go to this location with some insight and avoid some of the pitfalls that I and other DMs have encountered here. Tarina's tip was accurate. Below the bathhouse is a hidden base of the cultist group, Bane, Ball, and Merkel. I won't go into the religious aspects of these three gods because that's really more of a lore video. You can go find those up elsewhere. Um, but there is some basic information regarding the three gods and their followers on page 231 in the appendix. Uh, you'll also find all the stat blocks for all the cultists there. There are about three different stat blocks for each god's cultist, so they are unique. Um, so you want to take a look at these and familiarize yourself with them before running this uh, location. All right, this is a huge 30 plus room dungeon with lots of interesting rooms to explore and villains to face off against. The purpose of this encounter is for the party to learn more about the cult and its activity in Baldur's Gate. Ultimately, the group will find a man named Mortlock Van Thamper and either get exposition about his family's plot to destroy Baldur's Gate or find themselves unable to save him and realize that his family at least must be working behind the veil for some evil purpose. The dungeon is hidden below a bathhouse that is secretly owned and operated by the Van Thamper family. Uh, the group is going to find Mortlock in the dungeon below. Mortlock thinks that he's there to help coordinate the attacks of the cultists, but, but in actuality he has been betrayed and is about to be killed. So the book allows the characters to arrive either during the night or during the day. And there are a couple of different things that will happen when they approach the bathhouse, again if it's at night or daytime. Uh, if the players arrive during the day, the bathhouse is what it is, a bathhouse. It's a one-story stuccoed building with stained glass windows and clay roof tiles. Ten-foot walls enclose a large courtyard outside the southeast corner of the building. There's a closed wooden door, and the courtyards are engraved with images of smiling nymphs dancing around, frolicking in water. There's nothing really suspicious about the bathhouse except that it has one of the more sophisticated plumbing systems in the city, although the characters, unless they are familiar with Baldur's Gate and the sewer systems, they would not know this. Uh, the bathhouse closes at night and opens at dawn. The city residents are often here as well. So if they approach at night, then the place will be closed and they'd have to do some breaking and entering to get inside. Either way, they first stumble upon the courtyard. Uh, the L-shaped courtyard features a trim lawn and nicely manicured shrubbery. 
There's a white marble benches and stone fountains. The key here is that there's an invisible imp perched in the southeast fountain. If the characters look like they're going to cause trouble, the imp will observe them, and they'll make he'll make sure to report to Thirstwell Van Thamper, the oldest son of Duke Thalamra Van Thamper. Now, Thirstwell is a practicing spellcaster, but ultimately, he has these imps that are out spying for him. Unfortunately, the book really doesn't do much with this. There's really nothing that Thirstwell does with the information that these imps collect, or at least nothing in the book that is supposed to be then presented to the characters in some meaningful way. Um, so you can you can kind of change this. You can either have a player perceive the imp, uh, maybe give it to the person with the highest passive perception check, or if they make perception checks, have them hear something, or or um, perhaps they can sense that something is watching them. At least give them some sort of a detail that that they will be able to look and explore further, and that would make them more interested in visiting the Van Thamper Villa at some point. Next, we go to D to the baths. If the players enter the bath during the daytime, then they will expect to find some humans there. You could be 1d6 human commoners bathing at any given moment. Uh, and if they come at night, then there will be three female human night blades. They are low-ranking cultists of Baal. They stand guard near the pools and attack trespassers on sight. It's also good because they have dark vision, so they will be able to stay in hiding very well and get a surprise attack on the group. If a fight does break out, then there is a necromite of Merkel, who's located in D4, who will join the fray in the second round of combat. The players will find out that the faucets in this bathhouse draw warm and cold water from pipes that run underneath the floor, which will give them a hint that there is a basement level. D3 is the south massage room. The room contains a massage table and clean towels. Um, there's a couple of other things that you would find typically in a, in a day spa. Um, if they are there during the daytime, then there is a masseuse named Jabaz who works here. If the players are here at date, if the players are here during the daytime, then they meet a masseuse named Jabaz who will offer a massage. But ultimately, Jabaz does not know that Duke Van Thamper has been running a secret cult underneath this spa. Uh, Jabaz really doesn't have any orders or any information, so the players won't really be able to gather much from Jabaz. D4 is the north massage room, and from midnight to dawn, there is a human necromite of Merkel here, again, the one we spoke about earlier in D2. The room is furnished in the same fashion as D3 with the additional feature of a secret door in the north wall. Uh, you can find this north secret door with a DC 10 perception check. So that's the bathhouse, really. It's a plain, simple day spa that the players can either go to at nighttime or in can either go to during the daytime or sneak in at night. Again, there'll be more opposition at night, uh, but there could be more social interaction during the daytime. Now we move on to D5, Welcome to the Dungeon. This is sort of a landing spot for the players at the bottom of the stairwell that goes down into the dungeon. Duke Van Thamper became aware of this dungeon when she was managing the city's water utilities. Um, that's kind of how she got her start in the government of Baldur's Gate. So when she noticed that this had a deep, expansive underground network, she used it as the base of operations for the Cult of the Dead Three. Now, there's a couple different features in this dungeon that you have to keep in mind at all times. First is that the rooms and corridors and staircases are made from a limestone and unlit unless the text states otherwise, which means that the character is going to need to rely on either dark vision or have a torch or a lantern or something like that. But really make sure that you don't just forget about that, because I know that it's there's a lot to manage, but the fact that this is a dark place is really important. Uh, many of the cultists have dark vision, so it's a huge advantage to them, and they're in their element, whereas the players are exploring something that's unknown to them. All of the corridors in the dungeon are about five feet wide, um, so it's really narrow only enough space for really one person to go through at a time. The rooms are a bit bigger. They have nine foot high ceilings, often braced by wooden beams. Uh, each beam can be destroyed. It's got 10 hit points and an armor class of 15. Uh, if you were destroyed the beams in the area, there's a 25% chance of the roof collapsing. Each creature that would be in the room has to succeed on a DC 15 saving throw or take 22 4d10 bludgeoning damage, uh, half on a successful save. Uh, the room would then also be difficult terrain for purposes of movement, which is kind of cool. Now, the doors are all made of rotting wood. It is very possible that the heroes could break down doors pretty easily. They only have about five hit points. And any secret door in this place looks like it's carved into the limestone. Uh, there's a DC 10 wisdom perception check to locate these secret doors. 
And finally, certain areas that are marked on the map are actually flooded with a murky water to a depth of two feet, making them difficult terrain. All right, so the players can either get to room D6 through a secret entrance uh, or by first going through the central hub of room D9. Uh, we're just going to keep going in order of the book, so we'll assume that the characters can find that secret door or eventually they will get there. D6 is a room with a bloated corpse in it. Floating face down in the middle of this flooded room is the bloated corpse of a shirtless male human with knife wounds in his back. The corpse was once a ball worshiper uh, who was killed by his peers allowing a, for allowing a target to escape. So you can kind of conclude the medicine check that this man has only been dead for about two days. Um, you know, something that was weird is I don't, I don't know how often these cultists clean out their areas, but um, to leave a dead body basically decaying in shallow water is kind of gross. And I don't know, even if I am a death god cultist, I think I'd want to remove the bodies. It probably smells really bad. I wouldn't want to be living in this dungeon with other people who don't clean up their dead bodies. D7 is a altar to the god Ball. Uh, there are wooden beams that brace the ceiling of this flooded chamber, and there's also a stone altar with entrails in the northeast corner. Hanging on the wall above the altar is a three-foot-tall steel mast cast in the form of a frowning human skull. So this is basically a altar that you know they use to sacrifice people, disembowel them, uh, but it is empty other than this. D8 is a moldy tapestry. There's a wall here in a dry alcove, although the the picture of the map actually looks like it is flooded. I think there might be a discrepancy here. The tapestry has yellow mold growing around the edges um, and mold clings to the back of it as well. It will release deadly spores if it is disturbed. If touched or disturbed, it can uh, force a creature in the area, which is a 10 foot cube, to take a DC 15 constitution saving throw or take 2d10 poison damage and be poisoned for one minute. While the poison is affecting creature in this way, they take 5 or 1d10 poison damage at the start of each of their turns. Sunlight or any amount of fire damage will instantly destroy the patch of yellow. The creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on a successful save. Sunlight or any amount of fire damage instantly destroys the patch of mold. All right, headed to D9, the dead three doors. Now, I just want to say something. When I was running this, I actually made a huge mistake, and I think it's very easy to misread this. So let's be clear here. The east door is the door that most of the characters will eventually go through. It's the door that leads to the most of the dungeon. The door to the south only goes to two rooms. The door to the north is presumably either where they came from or will lead them back to D5 if they came through the secret door. Um, so there really is only one real main way that they want to go. They want to go through that east door. The room is kind of circular uh, with the western hallway leading to D8 and D7. So there's no door there. Uh, when I read this, my characters actually came from D5 straight through to the door. I just assumed that one of the doors led west. Each of the doors has the face of a different god on it. The east door has a carving of Bane, the lawful evil god of tyranny. The north door has a carving of Baal, the chaotic evil god of murder. And the south door has the carving of Merkel, the neutral evil lord of bones. So each of their individual icons is on a door, and ultimately they will have to choose which one to go through they don't really lead anywhere, the north and the south door. So my characters debated as to which kind of god they wanted to approach first. They did religion checks, they tried to gather as much information as they could from the party and figure out which door they wanted to maybe go through, as if it were to lead to a different route or different location or some importance of picking the right god. Um, this this is not the case. Unfortunately, it's, it's not really designed that way. They basically are going to end up going through the east door to progress the story. Again, if they go south, they're going to enter into two rooms. D10 is a necromite room, which is basically a uh, Merkel's, which basically has three necromites of Merkel playing dead on the floor. Uh, I guess they'd have to know that the characters were coming, so they probably heard them from D9, or they were just laying here for the fun of it. Uh, again, I think this has to be that they knew that the characters were coming. Unless your group was super loud, I'd give your group a chance to either make a group stealth check or a percentile check, 50-50, that they would um, surprise the, Ner the Merkel Necromites. I don't think it's really fair that they would be lying down playing dead. Uh, if a character wants, they can use an insight check of DC-10 to try to fee figure out that the, the Necromites are playing uh, dead, they're just faking it, and 
you know, be able to to be prepared for the attack that the Necromites will give them. If any character enters the room, the Necromites will jump into the fight. D11 is a partially collapsed crypt. There are three spell books beneath dust and humanoid bones in the sarcophagus. The three spell books do contain a variety of spells. The first one has burning hands, detect magic, disguise self, fog cloud, ray of sickness, and silent image. Spell book two has a personal rune of its previous owner burned to the umber cover. This book contains the following spells, Charm Person, Find Familiar, Identify, Magic Missile, and Sleep. The third spell book is found, bound in a scaly black reptile hide and contains the following spells, Cloud of Daggers, Dark Vision, Detect Magic, Feather Fall, Mage Armor, Magic Missile, and Tasha's Hideous Laughter. D12 is Bane's Altar. So unless the characters take extra special care to be quiet and travel without light, the uh, occupants of this room will see them coming because there is that little hallway before they get to the room. And the eastern part of this room is unlit, flooded, and braced with floor-to-ceiling wooden beams. There are rough-hewn steps that rise out of the murky water to the western portion of the room, which is dry and lit by two torches in sconces. So this is a room that is already lit. Shackled to the wall behind the altar is a sickly man wearing a loincloth and a burlap sack over his head. In an alcove in the north wall contains a freestanding suit of plate armor missing its helm. Standing before the altar are two grim figures, a powerfully built woman clutching a mace, and an even bigger man wearing a bucket helm. The helmed man is jabbing the prisoner with a spear, causing him to twitch. Both figures are clad in chainmail, and the woman carries a wooden shield with a leering skull painted on it. So the two armored figures do have names. Uh, the first is a female human fist of bane. Uh, named Kazira, and Yingath is the male uh, human iron console. Again, both the Fist of Bane and the Iron Console have rules in the back of the book. I suggest you check them out. So if the characters defeat the Fist of Bane and the Iron Console, they can perhaps save the prisoner. The prisoner's name is Klim Jasso, a male human noble who was captured in the lower city two days ago after his bodyguard was slain. Now, Klim is a uh, neutral evil noble. He only has one hit point remaining when the characters find him. Um, he speaks common and elvish. He doesn't really have that much information to share, uh, but he does explain that he is uh, a heir to a upper city family, um, except uh, he is kind of lying when he does offer a reward to the group for helping him get back, to back home. Uh, he actually has siblings who are more than happy to probably let him die so that they can split their inheritance three ways instead of four ways. Ultimately, they can let Klim go, which is possible. He could try to find his way back home, or they can take him and tag along with the group. Uh, if they do this, I think it would be possible that the cultists in the future could target Klim, which would actually be kind of good for the group, because as I mentioned before, this is kind of a grind of a dungeon. Uh, there will be lots of encounters, and I don't think that there really should be that much time for them to take a lot of rests, and even short rests, I think, if they're making noise and moving through, they want to go fast. So if you have some of these freed prisoners that they've kind of rescued, they might be able to take some of the attacks from the cultists in the future. Oh, one also thing to note here is that the uh, suit of armor that's in this room, it actually is harmless. It, it is welded together. It really doesn't do much, but its gauntlets can be activated. They become flying swords for all statistical purposes, but they deal bludgeoning damage instead. So during the fight, um, the cultists can activate these gauntlets, and this would be another distraction for your group to have to deal with. D13 is the morgue, and I cannot express how many times I have seen posts in social media uh, forums about this specific location. I think more characters have probably died in Descent to Avernus from D13, the morgue, than any other place. Uh, it is a simple yet really deadly encounter. This room is partially collapsed. Uh, there's three wooden beams that brace the ceiling and situated between the beams is a scorched wooden table with human cadaver resting on top of it. There's a frighteningly thin woman in a black robe studying the corpse and around her feet creep a swarm of skeletal rats. So the necromancer that they meet here is named Flennis. Flennis is a female human master of souls, the highest ranking Merkle follower in the book. Um, you can also use a swarm of skeletal rats uh, stat block to represent the rats at, their at her feet. I know what you're thinking. One necromancer and some swarms. Not that deadly. Except that Flennis is a very potent spellcaster. 
Uh, Flannis can cast spells up to level three, and she has Fireball prepared. The Master of Souls stat block also has a special ability called Grave Magic. When the Master of Souls casts a spell that deals damage, it can change the spell's damage type to necrotic. So that's right, a giant necrotic fireball. And this is a TPK waiting to happen. So there are a couple ways you can approach this. Um, either one way to do this it would be just simply don't let Flennis cast fireball, period. Um, if you think it's too powerful, if you think your group is going to um, they're already weakened at this point and they're going to die probably from this fireball, then just don't cast it if that's what you want. If you want to cast it on the first person that walks in, if not everybody's in the room when the combat starts, um, then you can only get the people in the room with the fireball. That's another way to approach it. To add insult to injury, while the Master of Souls is not a great martial combatant, Flennis does have a Silvered Skull Flail. Uh, the Silvered Skull Flail only has a plus two to hit because, again, this is a wizard, basically. Uh, but if it hits, if this flail hits, it does a D8 bludgeoning damage as well as 4D6 or 14 on average necrotic damage. That is like instant death for a level two uh, character. If they were to be hit by this, they would on average be getting 18 damage. Um, unless they're a barbarian, fighter, or paladin, they're most likely going to be killed. They're going to be brought to zero, at least by this one attack. They can also cast Chill Touch as a cantrip, Ray of Sickness, and Scorching Ray. And for non-damage dealing spells, we have a couple of other really great gems here like Shield, Darkness, Misty Step, and Animate Dead, which there is a cadaver on the table to animate. So it is a very, very deadly encounter here. In fact, I don't really even understand why they would put a challenge rating for character as well as some swarms for the other party members to deal with in this dungeon that is supposed to be a kind of a grind of a dungeon. There's no way that a second level group of heroes will be ready to continue the dungeon from this point on. And I kind of got that experience firsthand. This is where my first character, first and only character death of the entire campaign occurred. Our wizard was uh, killed by the necrotic fireball. You can also play Flennis as kind of like a mad scientist where even though uh, she is uh, obviously powerful and capable, she doesn't always use her powers. She might spend a whole turn uh, talking and laugh, laughing maniacally at the group. Uh, perhaps she'll be giving away a little bit of information and exposition of what they're doing here while her rats attack. Perhaps she'll spend her first turn animating a cadaver and using some kind of defense spells. Um, you do not have to make this encounter deadly to be thematic. All right, so D14 is the hungry rat room. There's an ordinary rat here that's looking for scraps of food. If you have the ability to talk with animals, like the speak with animals spell, then you can uh, get information from it. If you talk to the rat and offer it food, it'll give you access to its limited knowledge of the dungeon. It doesn't know where secret doors are, but it is aware generally of the layout of the dungeon. Um, you can kind of the characters take this rat along with them if they would like to, as long as they give it food. I think that would be the, the real prerequisite for this rat to travel with them. D15 is a flooded room. Um, there's really nothing interest, of interest here. But D16 is a, a flooded crypt, which does have a trap in it. There is a sarcophagus in the room, and if the sarcophagus is disturbed, a ghostly battle axe will appear above the sarcophagus. The battle axe created by magic, similar to spiritual weapon spell, and it's treated as a second level spell for the effects of this trap. Its ghostly battle axe can't be harmed and can't leave the room. It only targets creatures acting on initiative count 20. So each of its turns it moves at 10 feet and makes the spell attack of plus 5 to hit and if it does hit it does 6 on average 1d8 plus 2 force damage. The effect ends when there are no longer any creatures in the room so if they back up the trap will reset uh, in 24 hours. Uh, personally if you are not intending on dragging this out very long if your characters move through a dungeon very slowly I could omit D14, 15, and 16. It doesn't really have much bearing on the overall story, and to be honest, it, one of the two of the three rooms are basically empty. That rat could appear in any hallway or room that they stumble upon. D17 is Merkel's altar. Uh, this dry, partially collapsed room contains a stone altar uh, with humanoid skulls and bones piled around it. The top of the altar is covered in dozens of half-melted candles made of black wax, all currently unlit. This gives me a real Warhammer 40k vibe, that dark fantasy element. If one more of the black candles are lit, uh, then they shed a green light that reveals the black writing on the walls. The writing, uh, which is not visible otherwise, 
reads in common, rise and be counted. If these words are spoken aloud, uh, then the words will vanish as the bones hidden under the debris of the north end of the room rise up, knit together, and form animated human skeletons. These skeletons are evil undead, and they will obey the commands of whoever spoke the words that raised them. D18 can be accessed from D12 or from D17. So whichever way you approach it, uh, D18 is the room with the gas buildup. The air in here smells like rotten eggs and the putrid stench carries beyond the room. So even before the characters get here, they could probably smell um, the gas in the room. If anyone wants to make a DC 10 wisdom survival check, they can realize that the stench is an indicator of a flammable gas in the room. If anybody were to light something or cast a spell that has flame in it, it would explode. Characters that succeed on a DC 15 dexterity saving throw will take 14 or 46 fire damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. The beams that are above the room will also burn and then eventually collapse, which can lead to a collapsed room, which we talked about earlier in the uh, dungeon overview. D19, D20, and D21 are crypts. Uh, the D19 is a partially collapsed crypt with uh, most of the uh, sarcophagus that's inside covered in debris. There's nothing of interest here. D20 is the half plundered crypt. Um, while the lid to the sarcophagus is open, there's really nothing of note in here either. Anyone that searches the sarcophagus, they will realize that there is a false bottom. If they smash through that plaster layer, they can find human remains uh, in a shallow pool of red brine. The mummy that's encased here has two moonstones worth 50 gold each embedded in the eye sockets and a bag of beans where the heart would be normally. The bag of beans are really cool. It's a magical object that has a random effect on a percentile dice. You should definitely check that out in the Dungeon Master's Guide. D21 is the zombie crypt. There are six shambling zombies in here that were created by Flennis. Um, again, it kind of one of these encounters that you could probably skip. Um, while it's cool to have zombies attack everybody, it's kind of weird that the uh, zombies are just chilling in here, really not doing much. And uh, if the characters wanted to close the door right away, I don't see why they could have couldn't avoid this one. And again, if your characters are already beat up by this point, uh, throwing six zombies at them is just going to feel tedious. D22 is the torture chamber. So followers of Bane torture and interrogate prisoners here. Uh, the walls of this room are covered in, with streaks and splashes of dried blood. There are two dangling bodies shackled to the east and south walls. One is an elderly male human, the other is a young female tiefling. Both are covered in bloody gashes and neither is moving. In the middle of the room, there's a sturdy wooden chair with bloody whip draped over it. The bucket, half filled with salt, sits on the floor nearby. So the followers of Bane here rub salt into the wounds of their victims. Uh, hoping to torture them and get them to, you know, leak information. The iron console that was in room D12 carries the keys to both sets of shackles here, or you could pick their shackles with a dexterity check uh, using a thieves tools. The DC is 15 here. The male human is dead. He was Ephanax Zalbor, a caravan coordinator employed by the Jasso Patriarch family, which is part owner of the trading coster that operates throughout the Western heartlands. The female has zero hit points. She's unconscious, but stable. Uh, she is Vendetta Cress. Again, these names are really off the charts here. The neutral commoner who speaks common and infernal, and infernal. She has resistance to fire damage and has dark vision. She is a tiefling. She was really just a bystander. She witnessed the interrogation and death of Ephanax, who was questioned at length about the Jasso family. If she's set free, she says that she will stay with the characters and given the opportunity to escape, uh, she will. Uh, she can tell the group that when she was incarcerated, she heard the sound of heavy stone doors scraping open and closed from time to time. Uh, this information might lead the characters to search for a secret door, which is in attached to the room D23 here. This will be an important secret door to get find because it will lead them to the kind of the key area of the dungeon. Uh, alternatively, you could just say that she's seen people come and go through that secret door entrance if the characters are having a hard time finding it. One thing to note here is if they wanted to interrogate any of these cultists, if they try to keep any of them alive, um, you could have some of them give out pieces of information, but try to avoid having any cultists tell uh, the group about Thalamra Van Thamper, or tell them anything about the plot to take Baldur's Gate down into Avernus like El Terrell. Um, you can have them be cryptic and give some information about how uh, Baldur's Gate is in trouble, it's next, um, there are people in, in high places at work, 
D24 is called Merkel's Rest. Uh, there are flickering torches and wall sconces that illuminate this room. The middle of the room is occupied by an open stone sarcophagus, bears no carvings or ornamentation, but it is full of humanoid skulls and bones. D25 is Bane's Rest. Slumped against the walls of this plundered, partially collapsed crypt are four sleeping fists of Bane. Uh, basically, uh, they're sleeping. The group could surprise them. They are fully armored and have their weapons nearby, so they could kind of grab them at a moment's notice. But uh, again, this is a, one of those combats that you could probably just forego. Or if you do want the group to have an advantage here, if they're really beat up, they could uh, get the jump on this sleeping group of cultists. Ball's Rest is the next room, D26. Uh, there is a Reaper of Ball here, female Reaper of Ball who lurks behind the sarcophagus. Four flickering torches and wall sconces light this partially collapsed crypt. An open sarcophagus in the middle of the area is filled to the rim with blood, with spillage streaking the sides of the sarcophagus and pooling around its base. So the Reaper of Ball, who's hiding in this room, can use the sky self to appear as a frail old woman. Um, she can use the alias Nebra. Uh, if she does use this alias, she'll try to uh, present herself as a slave. She can uh, act as if she wants to escape and uh, will tag along with the party. This is a cool opportunity to kind of betray them in, in some sort of a way at the end. So if the characters find the secret door here, which we discussed earlier, it will lead them into D27, Echoes of Battle. This 10-foot wide flooded passage is braced at regular intervals by wooden beams. Old torch stubs float in the murky water. So now you're in the, the characters here, echoes of battle unfolding in the locations ahead. D28 is the old cellar. There are four human skeletons that are animated here, ready to attack anyone that crosses the room. Again, probably if you are characters are low on health and resources at this point, forego this combat. It's just kind of adding insult to injury to throw three more four more skeletons at them. And I don't think that they would really in approach this room unless they're a very thorough group because in, in D29, this is the sounds that they've probably been hearing, the echoes of battle. Mortlock is in this room. Here's a description. Beyond the hall, a flooded chamber opens up with rough hewn steps climbing to the south, north, and northeast. The floor buckles up above the waterline in the middle of the room, forming a small island. Corpses and doused torches float in the water around the island, atop which two men circle each other with weapons bared. One of the men, one of the men, a tall, unarmored brute with a great club and scarred face, towers above his opponent, but is gravely wounded. The smaller figure is muscular and bare-chested. He clutches a bloody dagger in one hand and the torch in the other. He has no flesh covering his skull. So the man with the great club is Mortlock Van Thamper. Um, Mortlock is the 29-year-old son of the Duke of the Lamra Van Thamper, who thinks that he's here to help organize the cultists, something he's probably been doing for weeks or maybe even months for his mother. Uh, but in fact, he was betrayed. His brothers actually set up a coup to kill Mortlock. Now, the man who has no flesh covering his skull is named Vaz, who is a death's head of Baal. This is probably one of the more powerful of the cultist stat blocks in the book, so be sure to take a look at this and know all of the special powers and actions they have. One of the really powerful traits that these uh, death heads of Baal have is called an aura of murder. So as long as the death's head is not incapacitated, hostile creatures within five feet of it gain vulnerability to piercing damage unless they have a resistance or immunity to such damage. This is absolutely insane because... Basically, every time they attack, they're doing double the amount of damage. Now, a dagger attack from a death's head would have a plus 7 to hit. Uh, it has got a throwing range of up to 60 feet. Obviously, it's better at 20 feet. Uh, but it can hit one target and do 1d4 plus 5 piercing damage. Now, on average, that's doing 15 damage every time this thing hits. It's also got multi-attack, so it can make two dagger attacks in a turn, as well as a stunning gaze. It can target one creature it can see within 30 feet, and that creature must succeed on a DC 14 wisdom saving throw or be stunned until its next turn. Oh, and by the way, it's got three reactions per day called Unstoppable. The Death's Head reduces the damage it takes from any attack to zero. Zero. This guy's a challenge rating five. He alone could probably deal with a level two party by himself let alone all the other encounters that they faced in this dungeon to this point. This is the culminating fight, so I get it. You want the characters to fight a villain who's really worthy, but this is absolutely overpowered, and there's no way that they can possibly defeat him. He has armor class of 15, 76 hit points. He even moves at a speed of 50 feet in a round. 
So this is this is a very powerful foe here, and I think the key is that you have to really make him uh, beat up and 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 at this point on the brink of death for them to fight him. Now Mortlock is no slouch either. Mortlock does have a great club that he can use here. Um, he and Mortlock does do a decent amount of damage when he hits with his great club, but this guy Vaz is so much more powerful, and he's going to most likely uh, kill someone at this point in the game. So the situation in this room is basically that Mortlock is uh, being murdered here. Uh, Mortlock is strong and tough and has been able to fend off some of the other assassins, but uh, Vaz is the last one standing, and Vaz has got Mortlock right where he wants him. Mortlock and Vaz stop fighting when the characters arrive, believing them to be Mortlock's associates. Vaz will disengage and run into D33, the room that's adjacent, um, where he'll make his last stand. But again, this is really, really dangerous. If the characters pursue Vaz, he most likely will kill them. They can talk to Mortlock and they can get a bunch of pieces of information here. I'm going to highlight some of the important ones here. Mortlock can tell them that he was betrayed. These assassins conspired with my brothers to kill me. If you hadn't come along, I'd be dead, so I owe you my life. My family is paying the dead three cultists to murder people in our city. Our goal is to prove that the Flaming Fist can't do its job. Once the city stops paying them, the Flaming Fist will have less of a reason to stay in Baldur's Gate. With them gone, no one can stand in the way of my mother becoming the city's next Grand Duke. If she gets her way, Baldur's Gate will share Elter Tyrell's fate and get dragged down into the Nine Hells. My mother is one of the three remaining members of the Council of Four, which governs Baldur's Gate. She was instrumental in convincing older Ravenguard to travel to El Tyrell and meet with its high overseer, Thavius Krieg. With Ravenguard gone, the Flaming Fist is leaderless and vulnerable. The Dead Three Cultists receive regular payments from my brother Amric, who runs his own money lending business out of a tavern called the Low Lantern. My mother doesn't expect much of me, but she thinks the world of Amric. He's always been her favorite. My oldest brother, Thirstwell, uses imps as spies throughout the city. He has a bathhouse under surveillance and probably knows you're here. He's very sickly and seldom leaves our mother's estate. If you've made it this far, you've killed most of the leaders of the Dead Three Cult. Without them, the cult will break up. The cultists keep their treasure nearby. If the characters let him go, Mortlock hides in the city until he books passage in a ship to leave Baldur's Gate. He has no intention of ever returning. So, with with this being said, I, there's the book wants the, to give the characters a lot of the plot points and and lead them in the direction of the Van Thampers uh, next. Clearly, right? Mortlock basically gives everything away here. I, I don't think this is actually very productive, and, I, and I'll tell you why. I think that it's probably best if Mortlock, since again, as he mentions himself, he's not the favorite. He could probably he's probably the least favorite uh, son of, of the Lamra. Maybe he just wasn't um, given a lot of the information. He was kind of kept in the dark here. Because if he goes and tells the characters every piece of information that we know as a dungeon master about uh, the Lamra Van Thamper, well, then the jig is basically up. There's no reason for them to go and, and kind of investigate. They can basically just tell the Flaming Fist this and let the Flaming Fist go and take over the investigation, arrest the, the Duke. Um, again, it's kind of just hearsay at this point. I'm not exactly sure how the legal system works in Baldur's Gate, but I would assume that uh, if they get this information, they can probably have the Lamar Van Thamper arrested. I would say he doesn't know that his mother is plotting to take the Baldur's Gate down to Avernus like El Terrell. It may be fiendish in background, but ultimately, he doesn't really exactly know what she plans to do. I also wouldn't say that he knows that the cult is going to break up at this point, because um, he doesn't know who they've killed, and to be honest, who's to say that every single cult leader was here at the same time? I think keeping the Cult of the Dead Three as a, a sort of a, a background sort of nuisance is not such a bad idea to have for further encounters. They might even have to track down Vaz if Vaz were to escape here. I also would leave out the part about older Ravenguard. Uh, I don't think that the Lamra would share this with Mortlock here, and it does still keep the intrigue about what happened to older Ravenguard for the characters to explore and find out later when they meet Rhea Mantlemorn and maybe uh, an older Ravenguard in El Terrell. So I'm going to go out of order here because at this point the characters should be encountering Vaz. They will probably fight Vaz in room D33. This is the Covenant of the Dead 3 room. Uh, this room has a center statue that resembles a heavily armored man whose face is hidden behind a fearsome visor of his helmet. He's painted red except for his right gauntlet, which is black, 
Clutch in the gauntlet is a red spear pointed upward. The statue in the north depicts a purple-garbed male noble wearing a harlequin mask and holding a dagger behind his back. And the statue in the south portrays a black-robed skeleton with its jaw open wide and bony hands outstretched. Obviously a statue representing each of the dead three gods. Bainites, Ballites, and Merkelites. They convene in this room to plan attacks against the city above. This is kind of their meeting room. The fight against Vaz will happen here. Uh, these statues do have some magical properties, though. So the Bane statue of the armored man uh, does have a spear, an uh, actual spear there, but it is non-magical. But the first time a humanoid comes within five feet of the statue, it must succeed on a DC-12 charisma save or be compelled to kneel. Because if you're forced to kneel, you can't move or take actions or reactions, uh, but you can still fight. So you're just there and you're forced to kneel at the statue. So the ball statue is the one with the Harlequin mask. Uh, this one doesn't have too many magical properties, but if you do separate the, uh, the veil from its face, it reveals a ghastly appearance, a skull-like visage. Uh, the Merkel statue does have magical properties too. The Merkel statue, if it is defaced or desecrated in any way, destroyed, broken, it will put a curse onto the player. Uh, the offender gains no benefits of magical healing until the curse is removed. D30 has Tiamat's stolen treasure. So a short flight of stairs climbs to a circular chamber with four padlocked wooden chests piled in the middle. The chests are locked, but the characters um, may be able to wrestle the keys from the iron console in D12. If you want, you can open it with thieves tools, alternatively a DC 15 dexterity check. Each chest is 25 pounds and contains stolen loot from Tiamat's hoard in Avernus. The treasure was brought by devils to Baldur's Gate in league with Zariel and was given to the cultists of the Dead Three by Amric Van Thamper on behalf of his mother, uh, the Duke. So there are four chests. The first one has 4,500 copper pieces, two red crystal vials with gold stoppers, about 25 gold each. Each vial is a potion of fire breath. The coins and vials inside make the chest weigh a total of 70 pounds. Chest two contains 10 eye agates. 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 Worth 10 gold pieces each, scattered amid 1,250 silver pieces. With the coins and gemstones, it weighs about 37 pounds. Chest 3 uh, contains a delicate porcelain dragon mask resting on a bed of 2,400 copper and 500 silver pieces. With the coins inside, the chest weighs 55 pounds. The mask is only a pound. Chest 4 contains a bronze crown with five spires, 250 gold pieces. Uh, worth of value. Each spire is shaped and painted to resemble one of the five kinds of chromatic dragons, black, blue, green, red, and white. The crown is about two and a half pounds. Rooms D31 and D32 just have some stolen goods in them. D31 has crates and crates of torches, so if you want to fill up on torches, go ahead. D32 has nine stolen wooden crates scattered throughout the room. Scurrying amongst them are harmless rats, like the ones encountered earlier. But in the crates, you have 10 days worth of rations, a bag of 20 caltrops, three flasks of alchemist fire, six sets of manacles, four tinderboxes, nine daggers, and four potions of healing. So that's the end of the Dungeon of the Dead 3. Surprise, Dragon Cultists! Just when the characters think that the encounter is over, that the dungeon is finished, and they head up to the bathhouse to, to leave, there will be Dragon Cultists waiting for them. Five figures will leap down from top the courtyard to confront the group. In addition to their black leather armor, they wear strange masks and cloaks that give each of them a vaguely dragon-like appearance. All five brandish curved steel blades reminiscent of dragon's claws. All right, so here you have uh, some dragon cultists of Tiamat. Um, there is a theme here. Dragons, uh, excuse me, Tiamat is present in the book. Uh, in hell is where Tiamat is being imprisoned. So get this, the uh, cultists of Tiamat were guided here by visions sent to them uh, from Tiamat herself. The cultists know that they're within 1,000 feet of her stolen loot. If the characters took any of the treasure, then the cultists will demand it back. I think that this is just kind of like a one final gotcha sort of moment that the writers put in here, just because uh, the dragon cultists really have no bearing on the overall story. It does tie in Tiamat just a bit, and so I think that if, at the very least it's a segue to Tiamat in Avernus. Your characters can be like, oh yeah, I remember those dragon cultists. So where to next? Well, the book suggests that now that the characters know that the Van Thampers have something to do with it, and whether you gave them all the information of Mortlock or not, uh, whether he had, had kept some to himself or didn't know about it, 
uh, they will probably still seek out the Van Thampers in some way. They can go and see Amrick at the Low Lantern, which is a place that he frequents, or they can go directly to the Van Thamper Villa. Either is really up to you. Um, I think that the, the Van Thamper Villa can be another pretty challenging uh, mega dungeon type location. So you either want to maybe give some space in between this with the Low Lantern or have them do some, you know, maybe some side quests within the city. All right, so let's review. This is a huge 30 plus room dungeon. And as you saw, the challenge ratings for some of the encounters are really, really difficult, uh, deadly encounters for groups of level one or even level two characters. If your group is level three, perhaps you started your group at level three, uh, this would probably be more of an appropriate level for the dungeon. But if, but if you are at level two, like my group was, you can probably expect to see some party uh, death. Maybe some characters will die here. Uh, in fact, that's what happened with my group. So when my wizard died by Flennis, the fireball casting a necromancer, they ended up leaving the dungeon shortly after it. They only explored a few more rooms and then decided to go back into the city and try to find someone to revive uh, their fallen hero. So if your characters decide to leave the dungeon, I don't think that they should be able to come back and pick up where they left off. If the cult was attacked, they would see this as their cover being blown and they need to relocate. I think they would probably go to the Van Thamper Villa, which is another location where cultists are living, uh, and, and report and, and try to find a new base of operations. What I did was had my characters come back and see it, basically a crime scene. It was all roped off and they had flaming fists there, kind of casing the scene, and they reported in and gave information that they knew about what happened, as well as kind of learned that the Mortlock Van Thamper was killed here. Even though they didn't get a chance to talk to Mortlock, they didn't get any of the information from him because, again, they never met him. Um, they found out because they're affiliated with the Flaming Fist, they were able to find the information that he died. That seems odd to the group that one of the Duke's sons was here in the dungeon with the cultists that they had been encountering. So it at least pins the Van Thampers to the cult, and that way they can then go explore and find out in a more natural way. So ways to improve or make this encounter more fun, I would definitely play the cultists as relatively smart. They could be fanatical and they could be kind of crazed, but they, they wouldn't be stupid. PCs are making a lot of noise, then I would go ahead and have the cultists either prepare for attacks, um, punishing the group for, you know, kind of just prancing around the dungeon, or have the cultists get ready to flee and actually don't stay and fight because they're maybe realizing that they're outmatched by these heroes. Depending on the group's level, the experience of your players, as well as the size of your party, you can kind of tone down the aura abilities of a lot of the cultists here. Don't allow them to always get their auras off all the time. Maybe, maybe it just works for the first round of combat or that there has to be an action to turn on or off. You can, you can really kind of tone down the, the combats that way rather than simply messing with, you know, the HP amounts. But that is another way to, to just tone down encounters in general, right? You can bring the HP levels down of all the characters, make people minions rather than full-fledged cultists. That means if they're a minion, they only have one hit point and any attack on them will kill them. Next thing I would make sure you do is don't give away too much information from Mortlock. Don't allow Mortlock to just info dump everything to the players here. It will take away from the intrigue, it will take away from the mystery, and it'll basically just give the characters every piece of information they need right here, perhaps your first, second, or third session of the campaign. Leave some of this as a secret and make sure that Morlock doesn't know too much of the information. And like I said before, this is going to push the characters to naturally want to investigate the Van Thampers in a more subtle way, figure out the mystery. If Mortlock is kept alive, he could also become an ally and kind of plot with the group to take out his mother and thwart whatever plan that she has. In fact, he could even do more investigating for the group and meet up with them later to reveal some more details. When the characters go to the Van Thamper Villa later in the uh, adventure, they can use Mortlock sort of as a distraction or a a, a tool to help them get into the villa in a way that would be more appropriate than just breaking and entering. All right, so that's all I have on the Dungeon of the Dead 3. If you like this video, please hit the like button below. Subscribe to the channel for more D&D content and live play games. Hit the bell icon for notifications so you know exactly when I drop a new video. All right, everybody, see you on the tabletop. Bye.